shots. A lot of people think of rim shots as just louder and not as different sound. And so turn the snares off and just explore. What's going on, everybody? Pat and Bob and Helen and James and Juan. Hopefully, everybody's doing well. And uh, let's see here. Helen, I don't know if I said hey to you, but I'm saying hey again. So twice, if maybe, ish, twice ish. Anyway, um, I haven't had enough sleep. This should be a fun call. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody's doing good. Um, we got we to gotta start with some wins, though. We got to start with wins. Grant, you got wins. I haven't seen. I just saw Grant a couple hours ago for the first time since uh, last week, sometime, sometime last week. Since then, I've been a lot of places. So, um, you got wins, man. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, all right. So last night was the first night I got to like do a little bit of jujitsu in like a month and a half. So that nice. that was really nice. Grant <laughs> almost ended somebody. himself and had. He, yeah. he had to go under under several procedures and yeah. so now he's finally back <laughs> yeah that was nice <laughs> yeah are you gaining the weight back though i'm dude it is slow and i'm just eating like i am eating insane amounts of calories every day and it is slow going <laughs> yeah well you know some people hate you for that uh, me i can i um <laughs> I didn't tell you I I weighed at the gym this morning I lost another pound and a half in the last six days so yeah yeah you know I cannot keep it I walked 22 miles in five days so in all that's fairness that's a lot of walking yeah it's what else are you gonna do Grant <laughs> when you're in Oklahoma and the nearest <laughs> coffee shops a mile and a half away um, oh I did discover a new music store though it's a music store but they have so many vintage drums I labeled it as a drum store. They have more drums than some drum stores have. And uh, the problem is the guy's a collector. So a lot of the things you ask about, he's like, oh, that's part of my private collection. That's part of my private. I'm like, well, do you just start this store so that your wife thinks that you have a store and really you're just collecting tubas and trombones, <laughs> Bob? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah i mean he has two it's stories it's called it's called horn it's trader i think it's called horn trader uh but anyway if you're if you're near oklahoma it's a killer vintage drum spot um they had tons of stuff um and he's a purist so he doesn't like to clean it up any of you collectors will understand that uh some of people like to restore it to full glory and some like to leave it and he is definitely the kind like oh it came with mud on it that's better for it I'm like ah, I think we should probably wipe that off so I did get I didn't tell you Grant I got a it was a kid's toy marching drum from like I don't know the 20s or 30s it's got this killer bass drum head on it um which is the reason I got it we're gonna hang it up but anyway that's what I got um wins anybody else got a win if you're new to the calls, we like to start with wins so that we can, um, we can, I, I think in, in the next year, I'm going to be really revamping um, some of the ways that we work people through the material so that we put first and foremost, uh, developing the habit of practicing and then developing that habit of seeing those daily wins and, and that type of a thing. So uh, that is, that will be coming hopefully in the next year, we'll be doing that. So um, I was trying to think of wins. My win is I'm awake right now, and that's a pretty good win, I'm feeling. <laughs> um, Pat's getting his taste back after COVID. Yeah, you had COVID, didn't you, Pat? How are you feeling? Can you talk? If you can't talk, just nod your head. I can't see you, though, so just... I... <laughs> um, I'm feeling good. It was, uh, wasn't much to it, actually. I didn't get severe symptoms. Had a fever for a few days uh <clears throat> little chest stuff and, and it was gone within within about five or six days oh, i nice. just kind of hang out here to, you know to be sure i didn't give it to somebody else but yeah it wasn't wasn't bad at all yeah that's awesome i i've, I've known several people that they they they're getting this year and 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 um doesn't seem to be as bad you know because they got it once or twice last year i got it twice last year yes lucky um yeah i got it twice and uh both times it was <laughs> It's really bad, actually. Um, so hopefully this time it won't be so bad. That's good. But, you, but your taste went? Because some people's taste didn't go. Yeah, it, yeah, I lost my taste. But I'm, I'm getting it back. It's kind of strange because 
some things I taste real well. Some things, you know, it's pretty bland, but it's, really? it's, it's coming. Huh. Mine, I didn't lose taste. Mine just started, everything tasted funny. It was like, you know. Well, yeah. It's, it's like that song, One Bourbon, One Scotch, One Beer. <laughs> Everybody funny. No, you funny too. Um, <laughs> if you haven't listened to that song, go listen to that song. It's, it's great. Um, good. I'm glad you're feeling better, man. That's good. That's a definite win. Um, let me catch up with the chat here because uh, I'm missing it. I had a win, kind of. Bob, do tell. Pat, I lost five pounds at the drum retreat. Wait a second, Pat. Uh, how did you lose weight at the drum retreat? We solely, like, we purposely focus on food so that everyone is in such a coma they can't notice it if they're having a bad time. <laughs> it's true. I got, I've gained it back, but I did. I did. That's crazy. Four, it's all the hard work we do. That's, that's, yeah. that's what it was. I, I check my watch every day, and I was, uh, according to the, the fitness thing on your, on your, excuse me, on your phone, uh, <clears throat> I was burning just there at the at the at the uh at the school i was burning about 500 calories a day oh wow yeah that's from morning until until we right just drumming shut it down yeah yeah i tell people all the time i'm like you know you can use drums as a like if you want to if you want to simulate running put your double pedal on and you know play 16th notes for like 10 15 minutes and you will be out of breath <laughs> You will be, you will be jogging the whole time. Um, let's see. Wait a second, uh, Bob. You kind of had a win. What's a what's a kind of win? Well, it's a win that not everyone's going to appreciate. I think oh, you okay. will. Okay. You're you're the kind of nerd that would like this. Oh, um, I'm definitely a nerd. My wife goes to a seamstress, this and she has like the start a, of a good joke. <laughs> Right, dyslexic guy walks into a bar. Um, exactly. But, uh, exactly. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. But um, she had she, the lady has old sewing machines and paraphernalia sitting out in the front, and next to one of the sewing machines was a couple of things that I knew what they were, and they weren't sewing items. She said they were. They were to hold bolts of cloth on each end. Now I'm going to show you this. Is that an orchestral symbol holder or not? Hold it. Uh, sorry, talk so you. you let's um, see. There it is. Is it? Is it? Um. Yeah, I. I. I mean, it looks like it to me. Now, if it if says, not, it could work. If it says Ludwig on it, what would you say? Well, of course. I okay. don't know. They were making Im imitation gun sounds in that time period. So Ludwig was wild. Um, but does it say Ludwig? It says Ludwig on them. So I think. Oh, yeah, well, then absolutely it is. Orchestral symbol holders. So I said, cool, but I don't have any orchestral symbols. So I. And she said, wait, I have this thing. It's a sewing utensil. And it's like, no, that's a symbol. She wasn't hip to drumming at all. She wasn't. <laughs> she, she insists I was wrong. You know, I mean, she never agreed with me. But. um. I looked up or orchestral symbols and took a deep dive on them. And I know that there's so much misinformation, so much, so much, so many people do not know what they are that is hard to find anything real about them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what makes an orchestral symbol different than a, your rider crash symbol? Um, I don't know that it's, I don't know. I will tell you this. When I went to Zildjian, I, they, I didn't really dive too much into the orchestral side of it, which that's actually fairly large money for them because those are very expensive. I know that they're more specifically tuned. I do know that they're a little bit more because they'll have conductors from the, the New York Philharmonic, you know, Philadelphia, Philharmonic, whatever. They'll come in and they will actually test out. They have a room where they can test orchestral cymbals to see how they, how they, uh, how they sound, but you know, it's a very good question. I do know that they're, they, they, I do know they specifically uh, make them different than drum set cymbals, but I really don't know how, because I, well, I, you know. I, um, I came out the other side of this rabbit hole. Okay. My friend in uh, New York, a pianist, his brother is a percussion player, or percussionist with the Cleveland Orchestra. Okay. I called him and said, 
call your brother and tell me what symbols he plays in the orchestra. I was waiting to hear, you know, some really fancy news. Right. I just heard two 18 inch Zildjian A crash symbols. This is what he yeah. only uses. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I mean, I truly think it's more of a combination of like what sounds good when we clang them together, you know? Um, but I know conductors will buy a set for the orchestra and they're very yes. adamant about how those sound. Matter of fact, it's one of my favorite rooms. It, it, no, excuse me. It is my favorite room in the whole world. So you go in this room at Zildjian and it's this, it's a box. I mean, not a box, but anybody who've been in the main tracking room, it's, it's a similar size, maybe a little smaller. And they, the walls are lined with speakers and black magic and, um, they, push this button and they can replicate any major concert hall or venue in the world. And uh, they said, you know, here's Carnegie Hall and they hit it and they, you know, you hit something. I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds pretty good. Well, then they change the button and they're like, here's Wembley Stadium. And then they hit them and I'm like, like, oh, you know, and I had to duck my head because it's, it sounded like we were in Wembley Stadium and we were just in Carnegie Hall and I, you know, my ears couldn't take it. So I got out of there quick, though, because I know there were witches in there. Um, and I think that they, they have some kind of deal with the devil that they make that happen. It's a really cool room, though. I got to oh, and we were just in Boston I, I, and I didn't go by and get a get a tour. So anyway, that reminds me of that. I'm glad you went down that that uh, dark black hole. I will say while we're on that subject, though, Bob, this is a really good one, because one of the best hi hat combinations I've ever had is an EFX top 16 inch crash that's the kind with the holes in it and then a bottom k light a k light top hi-hat as the bottom so it's very thin and crispy um so if you have crashes and you have a couple of sets of hi-hats it's a really fun experiment to start messing around with them yeah. so take the top hi-hat from one and put it on top of the other or take a crash symbol Put it on the bottom or put it on the top of, of you know like just make different combinations and see what they sound like you may come out with something that you really love uh which is why these days it really doesn't matter what a symbol's labeled whether it's labeled a crash or a ride or a ride crash or whatever it's what it sounds best as you know it, it it's you get you get old school cats that are very angry whenever you put a you use a ride symbol as a crash um they're like it says ride they made it for a ride i'm like even they say we don't care how you <laughs> paul's like i don't care how you hit it <laughs> just hit the symbol you know so i i use a for my main setup i use my right crash is a 22 inch renaissance ride symbol um and i use it strictly as a crash so that's cool though i'm glad you found those though that's it's quite the that's quite the grab yeah i'm gonna get some symbols and um try them out try them i think you should go march around place. your neighborhood <laughs> really freak, you know, really freak people out. <laughs> I walked around the neighborhood with my uh, slide whistle, so this wouldn't be that different. Right? Oh, one day I'm going to move your neighborhood, Bob, just so I can watch, <laughs> just so I can observe. Um, all right. Uh, Isles says, this week for the first time, I played the full version of Sowing the Seeds of Love, Tears for Fears. I even managed to record it and share with the community. I work on this song for a year. It has been... It has many different fills and even three solos. I'm so proud of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, whenever, whenever you've worked on something that long, that's amazing. Um, very cool. I'll have to go look for that in the community. We did, uh, by the way, we did update things. You should be getting email notifications. We talked to customer support or our support with um, the forums that we use and all the settings are correct. Nothing's changed on our end. Everything is updated. Um, so I would start, there may be some settings in your actual account in the forums that we may need to look at as well. Um, you may not be subscribed or, or uh, to certain email, to certain threads. Maybe that's why as well. Check your spam or your trash. Uh, sometimes email servers can do a massive update. And all of a sudden we have an email that has always been delivered to you. Now they're calling it spam and it's going to go somewhere else. Um, so do some of that. I know, Isle, you were having some trouble with that and some others, but I know grants had stopped working, but now it's working again since we updated everything. And, and so um, how do you turn them off? How do you turn them off? That's yeah. a good question, Grant. You, how do you, you turn can them go off? In, 
you go into your account settings in the forums and then uh, there's a button that says notifications and then you can select like if you uh, follow a thread, you can get email notifications. If you tag, you can like select how you want to be notified okay. or not notified at all via email or like an alert, like the notification symbol in the forums. You can toggle right. that as well. Okay, good. good. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I'm looking, I'm looking. Yeah, I'll say you did all of these steps, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe give us, uh, maybe uh, send Grant your login information, um, and we can try that. Um, we'll we'll log in and, and and mess around and see if we can if we can make that happen, um, and uh, for you. But um, anyway, sorry about that. Um, that is kind of a pain when things work and then they don't work. Um, all right, we got some um, submitted questions. Uh, <laughs> Bill said, did, did Grant have to get permission from his bandmates before he got a haircut? They actually don't even know that I cut my hair yet. Oh. So <laughs> they're, they're going to be surprised next time they see me. <laughs> uh, uh, our lead singer the other night um, decided that he was going to wax his nose hairs. Mm. I don't know <laughs> why. Um, so got the kid out and he did, he did that. I can hear someone laughing already. It was kind of comical because we were in the middle of this field in Colorado. And he, he did this and, on tour? And, yeah, it was like 10 minutes before we went on. And I went in and, and I just walked in on it. I had been, I had hiked to the top of this hill where there was a caveman footprint. I got a picture of that. That's pretty cool. It was on, on the ceiling. I, I, I'm skeptical, but they said it's caveman. So, okay, whatever. Um, and I come back down because we were going to play. And I walked on and he had, you know, a Q-tip and was rubbing blue stuff in his nose. And I'm like, what's happening, guys? Um, and he said, oh, I'm waxing my nose hairs. And I said, um, we go on in like 15 minutes, you know. Is that, he's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. Like, okay. And then all of a sudden, oh, shoot, I got it in my mustache. I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. So you then he tried, to, he tried to cut that with his knife. If you wanted to know what life on tour is like, it's, it's not actually, um, this is what we do a lot of times. Anyway, so he's trying to cut the wax with his knife. So when he pulls, it doesn't pull that. And then he thought, okay, well, maybe I can, you know, so maybe I can melt it off. So he heats some water up and he's like, you know, trying to pour that on his face, but that wasn't a good idea because it's scalding water anyway. And we're like 10 minutes from going on. So he pulls it. And all of it comes off, and so does a little divot of his mustache. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, shoot, man, what am I supposed to do? And I'm like, well, you better cut the other side. So then he cuts the other side so it's even. But he's got a very blonde mustache. So anyway, and then we went and played a show. Um, Steven, there's a guy on YouTube who um, braids his uh, nose hair. Mm. Hey, that is total cowboy move with a knife instead of scissors, too, man. <laughs> there are, there are yeah. a lot of weapons on our bus, actually. Um, <laughs> it's a surprising number of weapons on our bus. Matter of fact, we were going to the airport the other day, and everybody checked bags three or four times and made sure all weapons and pocket knives are a big one in the South. We're not, and then our front of house guy missed a pocket knife in one of his pockets, you know. And they, they pulled him aside. They said, sir, do you have anything on you? And he said, uh, no. And they go, you sure about that? <laughs> and he said, oh, man. So he had to give up his pocket knife anyway. Um, we got some submitted questions, don't we, Grant? Yes. <laughs> um, we have a question from Russ. He says, what's the correct hand technique for playing rim shots, especially for fairly quick rim shots in a ghost note-esque pattern? Also, where's the optimal position to strike the rim? And should I turn the stick around to get an even fuller sound? Um, I may not be able to join the live Q&A, so thanks in advance. This is a loaded question. Let me handle these one at a time. Um, so rim shots for me is a lot of sitting there and figuring out what is the slant of your drum? How are you sitting? It's really more about the ergonomics of how you're striking the drum, how you're sitting, how your drum is set up, and then based upon that, getting a consistent sound. So, okay, my drum's here, and I can hit it. I hit it, to your question, 
I hit it about an inch off center. Um, I tried to hit direct. I mean, you can hit center, but I, I find about an inch off center for me. Um, and then for those of you that don't know, a rim shot is where we're hitting the rim of the drum and the head of the drum at the same time. So this is not a rim shot. This is a rim shot. Man, I was concerned I wasn't going to nail that because I haven't played this kit since I've been home. So I'm pretty, pretty pumped about that. Uh, it gives you a lot more power uh, and clarity and attack with the with the note. Um, so that is the, that's a kind of the first one as far as best position. To me, it's just listen. You know, what's the position that you're looking for as far as the sound you're going for? And then it's replicating that consistently. So watch some of your favorite drummers and don't watch their drumming. Watch their, watch their, uh, the arc of motion that they go through, ARC. Um, uh, so if they're, you know, a good one that comes right off uh, top of my head uh, is Jeff Picaro when he's doing a half, uh, like the, you know, a halftime shuffle or a 16th notes on the hi-hat. Watch his hand. But don't watch the notes. Watch the motion the hand's doing. If you gr if you gridded that, you would find his hand is doing a very similar motion this the same way every time. Same thing with backbeats. If you go see me me play live or any drummer that uh, is is out touring and playing eight million backbeats every night, my hand is going to be making the exact same. And if you pause the video on each one of those, you'd probably find my stick was coming up to the same crack in the wall behind me. Like it's gonna, it's the same motion because that's the, that's economy of motion. And that's how we get a consistent sound. The thing I have to watch on tour is to make sure I'm not hitting my leg every time uh, because that is how a lot of people will know they're getting the, the, a, a solid placement of their um, rim shot is they lightly hit their leg with their hand every time they come down. And that rim shot is kind of set just perfectly there. Now, I got nothing wrong if you, if you raise your leg just a little bit till your pinky comes into contact with it, so you have a physical sense of when that's happening. The problem comes, I used to have bruises on my thighs. Um, I'm wearing shorts, a lot of kneecap on the video today. I'm sorry to everyone. Um, I was checking to see if I had a bruise, but I don't, um, which is good. Um, so my pinky does come into contact with my leg and it's more of a consistency thing. It's more so I know that every time I hit, it's the same thing. So I would spend some time in your practice time exploring where's the best sound for you, where is my drum set up, and then how can I replicate that? That's why in the, in the beginner lesson track, it's not very many lessons in before I go through how to set up your drums for you. And I tell students all the time, I'm like, I literally don't care how you set your drums up. It's fine. As long as it's not hurting you, it's fine. But decide. Because if we change the setup every time we sit down, it's very, very hard to make a consistent sound. When you see me sit down at a drum set, even if it's not my drum kit, the first thing I'm going to be doing is try to get things somewhat close to what I'm used to. The reason for that is so that I can get consistent sounds. Um, so that's, that's what I would do. An interesting thing we can also do with rim shots, a lot of people think of rim shots as just louder and not as different sound. And so um, I think it's incredibly hip to come back and... You get this nice lighter snare hit with a lot of overtone, right? If I turn the snares off. You can almost make this sound a little bit like a piccolo by getting back there on that rim. Um, and so it's sometimes if you're playing at lower volumes. So it's not for every application, but it can be a lot of fun to play around with the different sounds that you get from your snare. I suggest to everyone taking their snare and taking it away from your drum kit 
And seeing how many different sounds you can get with just a snare drum, because of the way it's set up, because of how light the bottom head is, um, due to the snares needing to respond, it's just different than a tom. And so turn the snares off and just explore like all the different You can get a ton of really fun sounds. Um, I used to have a samba that I would play. Uh, I don't know, let me see if I can remember it. Hold up. Obviously, that's not gonna. I would brush it up. But that's not something I play in a song. But it came from me just exploring the snare drum um, and getting the different sounds. But the first thing I would do is look at your setup, get that consistent. Look at your arc of motion, ARC, uh, for whatever limb, uh, and then let's let's mimic that every time to get a consistent sound. Uh, I suggest everyone um, get a cheap a mirror like you keep in your dorm room in college get them for like 10 15 bucks right uh and we can keep that um by our drum set um what's up john i just saw you joined us we can keep that by your drum set and all you do is you just look at what's going on and whenever i was trying to get consistent sounds i would try to see like okay when i do a backbeat there's where my stick goes to and i would actually go over to the mirror and i would mark with a with a sharpie but mark on the mirror and then i would try to visually hit that every time uh, and I did that for different things. When I was learning brush patterns, I had a drum head that I actually drew the brush patterns on. Each different pattern had a different drum head. And that's how, because they call it, you know, stir in the soup. You're sitting there and it's because brushes are more about side to side motion rather than up and down motion. Um, so don't be afraid to use visual cues like that because as drummers for velocity, for volume and dynamics, it's, it's actually pretty important, the uh, pathways of motion that we go through uh, with, our, with our bodies. Um, Can I ask you a quick question about rim shots? Yeah, go ahead. Um, missed rim shots. Those are my specialty. Um, yeah. When I miss them and I hit the drum, I can get away with it. But man, mm -hmm. when I hit the rim only, that's yes. terrible. That's yeah. awful. Yeah, so, you, really, you really feel like an idiot, don't you? Yeah, you I, really, I, over you really drumming, I kept. Yeah, I, it's like hitting your own finger. I still feel so stupid every time I hit my own hand. I get so mad at myself, too, you know? As if I could have like, helped it or something. Well, I find myself trying to play so that almost as insurance, if I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss on the skin. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably not a good way to do it. I should probably commit myself to a, a good, solid um, rim shot every time. Well, you know, and I don't think it's bad to, to, to make a fail safe in case, you know. So in other words, have the stick a little bit more forward instead of a little bit more back. Right, right. I don't think that's bad, but yeah, you're right. You can miss one of two ways. And if you miss the second way, it's just sounds kind of, you know, he's talking about you, you hit it like this instead of missing the rim shot here. That's survivable. This is a rim shot. And this is hitting it without that rim shot. Yeah. You know, just you're going for super loud and you get nothing. You just get nothing. It's like when our sound guy decides not to turn my gong drum on. I just look like a moron. It's like, <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't, there's no sound. And I look back at him, I'm like, come on, man. Like, are you mad at me? Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> Why do you do that to me? <laughs> um, oh, the other question he asked, should you turn the stick around so that you get a fatter sound? All right, so this is, there's actually multiple people at multiple schools of thought. One of our guest artists, who's the most popular guest artist we have, oh, one of them, Steve Gould, beautiful player. He always plays with the butt end of the stick like that on the snare drum. He feels it gives him a fatter sound. And if you've listened to Steve Gould play, um, I think whatever Steve feels gives him a better sound, he should keep doing because he sounds amazing. Um, the guy is just such a beautiful player. He took from Dave King, also somebody we've had as a guest artist. Um, so I think, again, I think, that's a, I think that's not a ask me. I think that's turn the stick around, see what it sounds like, you know? 
Um, see, see if that sounds better to you. I do know there are a lot of cats, and myself included, that sometimes I turn that stick around because it does, it has a fatter sound. It's a fatter end of the stick. You're hitting with more body instead of a tapered neck. I believe it's going to be a fatter sound. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking, you know, red versus green here. We're, we're talking fuchsia versus red or something it's a bit a varied shade of red right but it is it is different and i think we should you know explore those things um if you got a question you can raise your hand uh let's see here yeah Juan said brushes are a puzzle do we have lessons on them i do have some introductory lessons on them yes they will teach you some uh, introductory patterns feel free to go check those out there is a great book by son of a gun um i can see his face i'll think of it in a little bit but I can't, I can't think of his name right this second. Clayton Cameron. Yes, I can. Clayton Cameron. He has an incredible book on brushes um, that taught me a lot about brushes too. So if you're looking for more uh, resources outside of, of what I offer um, and you want to take a real deep dive, you really don't need online. Like you don't, and I'm an online teacher telling you this, you should go, you should go buy Clayton Cameron's book. Anybody that comes here for a camp that I'll point to my, I'm like, go to that shelf. That shelf has all the books I used, you know, like uh, I, I have, you know, all my brushes came from Clayton Cameron's book. I had some teachers that taught me, but it was really it was mainly Clayton's book. <laughs> he's also an artist. So he drew everything um, and, and he's very specific um, with, with how he sounds. So that and um, Jeff, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Bigger jazz player. I can't remember his name now. He's a fan. Jeff Hamilton. <laughs> I need to just start saying I can't remember their name, and then I remember their name. Uh, Jeff Hamilton. Listen to his brush playing. He's a phenomenal brush player. Um, John, what's up, man? How are you? Not too bad. How are you doing? I'm great, man. Good to hear. Good to hear. I have the most basic of the basic questions, but it's like been it. kind of eating at me. So I've been uh, really enjoying your series on the molar strokes. I'm about to get into the interlacing hands. It's helped a lot. I can see why you stacked it a little further along for obvious reasons. But for the life of me, now that I got you here, I could have sworn you always kind of, you know, use the pointer finger. But I could have sworn in the videos, especially with the close-ups, you're kind of gripping it more middle. Yeah. And this is kind of along for the ride all loose with the others. Mm -hmm. as so this is a good question. Um, for many years, I played from... Wait a second. Movie magic. Uh, awkwardly slow zoom. Don't worry. It's coming closer. Yes, more. Here we go. Okay. Dynamic, so, um, I'm sorry you had to go through that, John. Um, <laughs> so for a long time, you can look up uh, some of the older videos on my YouTube channel. And you will see me gripping from here. And this is not wrong. This is, this is a way that you will see many drummers grip. Um, for me... After many injuries, about uh, 10, 11 years ago, I redid my hand technique. And when I started learning the drums, um, I was 14 and into punk rock music and didn't want to sit there with hand technique. And I had good teachers and they tried, but I just kind of glossed over it and I kind of settled on pinching right here. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing that uh, it really, we just need to look at what it does. When you, when you pinch from right here and you grip from right here, so in other words, this is your gripping point, but it's also your fulcrum point, because if you're gripping from there, it's got it's to gotta, it's gotta be the fulcrum too. For me, I think of a grip as a cradle now instead of, a, um, instead of really cranking down on the stick. I also don't think of the different grips as German, French. I think that we have different hand positions, mm -hmm. uh, German, French, American, just positions of my hand. There are only two different grips, traditional grip and match grip. I guess you could go reverse traditional grip. Uh, but these are the two grips, right? Traditional and matched for me. So whenever we're gripping the stick from here, that is our point where we're holding the stick. It introduces tension into the stick. And for me, I had several injuries uh, to my wrists and then injuries to up here. So tennis elbow, if you're having pain up here, this is tennis elbow. 
I'm not a doctor. Go see one if you're hurting. I don't pretend to be one on the internet. So let's go ahead and give that disclaimer. This is golfer's elbow. So if you're hurting underneath here, this is a golfer's elbow and this is a tennis elbow. Um, I injured my wrist, like lots of different injuries. And so when we hit the drum, this is a way longer explanation than you wanted. Sorry about that, John. Uh, when we hit the drum, there is, uh, there is energy, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I'm also not a scientist or, you know, whatever that goes into. Uh, but what happens is we create energy and that energy dissipates. Uh, some of it comes out in sound waves, right? Um, some of it goes back into the stick, right? So you, you, if, you, if you hit a pad and you hold it very loosely, you can hear the stick and then crank down on the stick and hit it again. And all of a sudden it won't, it won't reverberate like it used to. So some of that energy, if let's say we hit a, uh, a drum, if we put it in slow-mo, you can see the drum head. There's some videos on, on YouTube of this and the symbol as well. You will see the drum head do this. Okay. Now we can't see it because it's not slow mo, but it will do this. So some of the energy is being dissipated into the drum head. Some of the energy is going out. All of these are waves, right? Some of this is going out in sound waves. Some of it is, is waves happening here on the drum head or the symbol. You'll see the symbol, sh the symbol shimmer. Um, and then some of it goes back into the stick and you can hear that reverberate if you're holding loosely. When we crank down on the stick, Another place that the, that, that um, uh, jarring motion or energy goes back into is your arm. Uh, so your arm is now absorbing some of the blow of hitting. And I think over the years, um, it's a physical instrument. We're probably going to injure ourselves at some point. That's okay. Um, that's why I'm so big on hitting the right way and, and doing correct technique. Even if you choose to hit like this, by the way, John, it's not mm -hmm. a wrong way. Um, but just knowing what's going on helps you make more informed decisions. So that is what happens. And I think over the years, I just kept injuring myself. And so I said, I want to go to playing from a place of as little tension as possible in my playing. I want, um, I want to have as little tension as possible in my hand. So if you look at, um, Annika Niles, if you look at Antonio Sanchez, Jojo Mayer. I'm giving you some players to go look at besides me. Um, oh, we had him on here as well. German educator. Grant, Klaus we have his... Klaus Hessler, thank you. Uh, you if Klaus is a fantastic guy to follow for. So it's a very loose. Jim Shapin also believed in this. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much Jim Shapin school. Um, <clears throat> Dom Famolaro will also teach this way. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you names so that you can go check with other people. Um, and I prefer that the stick be as loose as possible. And I think of my hand <clears throat> more as a cradle, the same way you would think of, um, and I think I talked about this in the lesson, holding a bird or holding a lizard. If we hold a bird too tight, we kill it, right? We hold it too loose and it flies away. But there is a way to cradle a bird that is just tight enough. Um, a cradle for a baby. It does not clamp the baby down. It lets it move, but it doesn't let it fall out, okay? So for me, I think about my hand as a cradle, and I want to think about the fulcrum point, which is not a grip point. The fulcrum is a balance point. Think of a seesaw. Um, and with a seesaw, you have a different balance point, so every stick has a different balance point. So I want to find the, the best fulcrum point where I'm getting the most bang for my buck, um, and I'm wanting to, to grip it there. So yeah, this guy is kind of out of a job when I'm playing because it's really balancing right here. Now, there are other players who have fulcrums in a different position. A real famous one, I know Bob and I have talked about this before, is Tony Williams. Tony Williams believed that you should be in complete control of the stick at all times. And there is actually an excellent video of him doing a clinic on YouTube. I'd have to go back and find it, where he explains his grip. Um, and it's kind of rare because I don't think Tony taught a, a whole lot. Um, so having him in a clinic explain, but he actually um, had more of a fulcrum at the back of his hand uh, than he did more towards the front. So you have some players that play here. It's just my only problem with pinching the stick right here is there's no way to alleviate the tension. To alleviate the tension, we have to move the balance point. Because if my balance point's right here, it's kind of an awkward 
thing. There's nothing there balancing the stick here. This is more of like a stop and go. You know, it, it, lets, the, it lets the stick go way up when I relax it, or it lets it not come very far up. Um, so it's more of a, of a break for me than anything else. Now I will use it if I turn my hand over and I'm playing in like French position. Um, I will use this and now my fulcrum kind of moves up here. I have been giving thought the past couple of years. This is how, this is what I do on my Friday nights. Uh, I've been giving thought to moving my fulcrum to this finger in French position as well. Um, although I have not done that because that uh, breaking down your technique when you're doing it for a living is um, really a pain. <laughs> um, and so I haven't done it. I don't think it's a wrong way to do it. I'm just interested. I'm interested in that. Uh, so when I turn it over in French position, my fulcrum will change to here. Um, but I think that's a little bit because my my thumb is a little bit back. My thumb's not here. In French position, my thumb's back here. So I kind of do have something to counterbalance in between those first two fingers, the stick. Uh, for me, for me, right. again, I can only teach you from my, you know, what I understand. To revamp my technique, I should say, I used uh, Jim Shapin's old videos. There's some great videos on YouTube that will tell you just about everything you need to know. Uh, and then I went through, uh, Jojo Mayer has an incredible DVD. Uh, is it Secret Drummers for Modern Warfare? Or... It's something yeah. about weapons and drummers and it being a secret. Um, and it's number one, the one where he's dealing with, with the hands. Um, I don't agree with everything about the way that he explains the molar stroke. Um, and that's based upon Klaus Hessler, who took from Jim Shapin, and we can just geek out about that. But it's a fantastic DVD with a lot of great information if you want secondary resources. But yeah, you're right. All of that to say, you are correct. Uh, used to, on older videos, you will see me pinching it from here. Uh, and now, sometimes you'll see pictures. Matter of fact, I've got a really good picture. I think it's my Facebook profile picture. And I'm in the middle of hitting a backbeat, and I've just opened up my finger. You know, a lot of times if I'm slamming backbeats, I want to be as relaxed as, you know, if I'm hitting. See how that finger, because I don't, I'm almost letting go of the stick sometimes. I don't want all that coming back into my arm. I don't want the jarring motion. I don't want to grip down like this. Like, that's a way different motion for me. It, it feels different. I can feel more activity here in my forearm. And that's not bad. If you want to do that, that's fine. But for me, after many injuries, I want to play from as uh, tension free of a position as I can. I don't want there to be tension in my chest, in my in my arms, in my leg. I want there to be, you know, like I don't want to be tensed up all the time uh, and try to muscle it out. So uh, does, does that answer a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I, I gave it a shot the last uh, few days in my practice. And at first it felt a little uncomfortable. And then I was starting to get a little used to it, but I did notice when I started to not think about it, I'd revert to the typical pointer finger mm -hmm. motion. Yeah. But one thing I did uh, realize that was very beneficial about it is, again, when you start going with the molar and trying to go a little faster and all that, and maybe not paying attention as well as I should, I have a problem of sometimes dropping my stick like uh, this way. But I found when it was pinched in the middle, I still had this guy as a safety net. So when I could feel it kind of slipping, this guy could catch it real quick so I could recover. So yeah. I wasn't sure if you were doing that for recovery reasons or bounce. It has a little more loose feel to it here. Than yeah, here. more from a tension standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to. And that's one of the reasons why um, I don't love it when I see a student with their pinky up. To have this finger hanging is no big deal. But to take the pinky off, to me, that's using a muscle. And mm -hmm. there's more tension in the hand when I'm holding the pinky up. And again, I want to go from as tensionless area as I can. So for me, you know, I'm like, hey, get that pinky, you know, around the around the stick at least. But you're right. You have to really focus on being able to revamp away from that. Um, and a really famous player that did this mid career is David Garibaldi. Uh, he took a couple lessons from Klaus. Klaus said he's like, an insane maniac Klaus is like I'll show this to people and usually it takes them months and he's like in a week Garibaldi came back and he's like like this and he's just playing as if it was always like that and he's like yeah that's yeah actually that's yeah that's what I'm talking about <laughs> you know um but and and a lot of people don't realize like I don't need any of my fingers like you can hit it like a caveman too uh let me give you an overhead shot see if I can and we can still 
you know, get plenty of rebound. So if I grip my sticks like this, I got no fingers there, you know? some of the of the of the finesse but i can still that's just you know me holding caveman style mm -hmm. so um it but it is a lot of work to revamp that uh just know that going in if you've played one way your whole life and you want to kind of revamp it I, this is what I tell everyone to do with technique. Do not let it take over your life. I am not of that school. There are some teachers that are like, stop everything. If you're doing something that's hurting you, I agree with that. Uh, other than that, I, 15 or 20 minutes at the front of your practice time and then move on. Like, let's play okay. some music, you know? Um, and that way, because I've, I've had people just get locked up with technique and I come back a year later and they hate music and they hate life and it's not fun. Like, I mean, you know, I guess it's fun if you're into the nuts and bolts kind of the, that thing, but mm -hmm. to me, music's fun. So let's a little bit of vegetables and some dessert, you know, let's try to balance it out. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you bet, man. Uh, Grant, we got another submitted question, right? Yes, we do. Oh, wait, um, we got a I... giveaway. Oh yeah, we do have a giveaway. Oh, man, Grant <laughs> dropping the ball. It's all the weight he's lost. Yeah, I lost it all in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I feel most days now. All right, what are we giving away, man? All right, we are giving away a SDS t-shirt. Yes, yes. Are you ready? James. It's very anticlimactic. I love it. James, you got a t-shirt, man. <laughs> Make sure that you um, uh, message Grant your, uh, your email address so he knows how to get in touch with you. Um, all right, we'll do a submitted question, then the has got to come at a question. So we'll do that as well. Um, you're more than welcome. And what's the next submitted question, Grant? What do you got? All right, the next submitted question is actually from Isle. Ooh, it's <laughs> so like a, there we go. There um, we go. So he's got a link in there. I want to make sure I get that. It's like that. Inception, what's happening here. That's not anything like that, but just let me think that way. All right, um, Isle attached a link um, in there. So click on that so you can kind of see what it's about. It says, uh, I posted the following question in the community forum. Can you demonstrate the preferred technique per ostinato? Thank you. So that link goes to some hi-hat ostinatos, and he's asking what kind of hand technique you prefer to use with each um, ostinato he listed. Okay, got you. So the first ostinato is straight 16th notes with one hand. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. There it is. <laughs> My favorite for that is uh, similar to some of my favorite players like Jeff Percaro and stuff. They would kind of like get in there and they got, it's, it's the molar pumping motion mixed with a little bit of push pull with my fingers depending on how fast we are. But you'll see me most of the time. Now, while I'm doing this motion with my hands, my fingers are opening a little bit, especially the faster we get if it's slower. I'm not, but the faster we get. That's, that's my favorite motion for that. And I condense it. I get smaller as we get faster. If you're playing like a good one would be Georgie Porgy by Toto. Um, it's just a, an, an insanely good groove. Um, another thing to take into account though, is what's the accent pattern? What is the sound you're wanting? So, that may not be that you may be wanting more. I have a very hard time getting that sound with, I can, but to me, it's not the same. It's more, it's kind of more of a forceful. So in that situation, you would see me hitting nothing but downs, uh, downstrokes on that. Um, okay, next one. Good question. I like this question. Ostinato one is two sixteenth notes and an eighth note. So one E and two E and three E and four E and one E and For 
for me, I use, I'll use uh, a molar three stroke there um, to get that bounce. Okay, obviously slower tempos. It's gonna be mostly downs, but as I speed up, it's an initiating stroke and then some rebound strokes and then back up to get the, the next one. Um, the next ostinato, this one's a little bit more troublesome. It's one eighth note with two sixteenth notes. Really, I use the same motion that I used on the one before on, on uh, uh, ostinato, uh, the last ostinato, the two sixteenth notes and an eighth note. I, but it's, I started on the upbeat. Mm -hmm. What is that? Uh, peg. Peg. I think that's the song. Uh, peg. It will go there. Sorry, I started playing the song. Um, so, but that's that's a really fun song that uses that ostinato uh, is peg, um, uh, and then another one is late in the evening. So that third ostinato, eighth note with two sixteenth notes. You can do peg if you want a real fast example. A slower example would in like halftime would be uh, late in the evening and then a middle of the road example would actually be cocaine yeah. We can go from a, a nice love song into doing drugs. So I think that segues nicely. If you're in a band, at those, that's actually a great medley to do. I would have to go back and track the BPMs, but I'm almost certain they're pretty close. It's just one is put into more of a halftime feel, and then cocaine is put into more of a full-time feel. But if you're in a band and looking for a medley, cocaine into late in the evening, come on. I think they go together. Um, not, not, not late in the evening. Wonderful tonight. Late in the evening yes. is. <laughs> uh, no. That's it. No, oh, come on. Here it is. Oh, you had it. I haven't played this song in forever. Here, I'm gonna now. I, I'm, I'm, we're not leaving until I get it. <laughs> Except he played it like this. Something stupid, you know? Why does Gad do this? Yeah. Anyway, um, I don't remember which stick goes here. I don't know if you were using these, Grant. I'm sorry. No, those are all it's yours. It's no longer a matched <laughs> pair. Yeah, they're not Vader. They're not Vader's. Um, yeah, I don't know how we got on to late in the evening. Wonderful Tonight, not late in the evening. Wonderful Tonight is a Paul, uh, no, Wonderful Tonight's a Clapton song. Late in the evening's a Paul Simon song. <laughs> We've gone through a lot of songs in like the past three minutes. I mean, I'm kind of winging them out here. Um, and I'm trying to think of a good song for that first one, uh, for the second one. I'll have to think on that one. Um, so, um, but I gave you a lot of songs for that third one. Pretty, pretty impressive. I remembered all those. Um, so for the last asano, you also use the three stroke molar before, but starting on the upbeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just do like a downstroke and then start it on the upbeat. 
Because um, once we once we get faster, you really have to let that rebound start to take control. Um, you know, if you, if you're playing like a fast samba. Right, so I'm really going to let the, the rebound begin to take over um, uh, whenever it gets to that. Yeah, ex excellent question, uh, I'll thank you for asking that, actually. Um, we had another one, though. Wait, uh, back aisle two. I recently noticed that sometimes the stick hits the edge of the cymbal, the hi-hat, which makes a different sound than if the stick hits the area of the center of the cymbal. It happens more when I use push-pull technique or play with two hands, 16th notes. Is this a common problem? I'm trying to raise my hand a bit through it. Still happens from time to time. Uh, you know, like, problem? I don't know. If it's a sound you're wanting, no. Um, but I, look, um, and those of you that play e-kits, I know those of you that play e-kits need to do this too. Oftentimes, I'll have a student, and I'm like, well, you know, what other sounds does your e-kit make? And they're like, I don't know. I just always picked this one. And I'm like, well, why didn't you pick another one? You know, go, that's the first thing we, we did whenever we set up the e-kit here at the studio. Grant and I were like, oh, oh cool. That's what, you know, we're like going through, oh, that's like asteroids or something. I don't know what that is. You know, we're just going through sounds. We barely even got anything done. We're just being idiots. Um, and um, so that's, with your drum kit, spend some time, you know, figuring out what are the different tones on a on a symbol and just just play one symbol you know your ride symbol there's so many different sounds on a ride symbol if you play it here very very much towards the edge of the symbol it's a different sound than if you play it up here it's a different sound if you play it here so if i want a real washy sound i do if i want a more there's a song that we play a very slow country ballad shuffle um i didn't think i'd say all those words in one sentence um and i play it more up here because i want a more attack driven sound but if i want wash here i'll play here and then yet more we often think of that as a crashing loud sound it doesn't have to be loud it can just be wash that sound I'm more pushing the cymbal than I am anything else I've got one song that we're playing in the set now and I do a lot more uh, pushing of the cymbals whenever I go to crash instead it's more of a it's more of a push into the cymbal than it is a crash and so whenever I'm playing this it doesn't have to be same way with this ride cymbal you can also get a way different sound on the bell if you play it up here real tingy sound versus down here and I'm playing with the tip of my stick right and there's kind of a magic area where it transitions from a bell into the uh, flatter part of the cymbal or what we would call the face of the cymbal and that's got a specific sound and that's all with just the tip now take the body of your stick And there's this real cool area that, that my uh, Henrique showed me when I was taking lessons from him. It's where the tip of the, uh, the stick meets the, the tapered shaft of the stick. And it's this real, it's like a, it's a different sound. And to me, that's my favorite bell sound. It's like right in that groove. Uh, and you have this, that's the tip of the stick, and this is the body of the stick. And then right here, that's a really cool sound. And Henrique used to have this groove that he had come up with where he used the, the tip and then right where the transition point and then the larger shot hit, and it sounded really cool. Um, so all of that to say, the same way I was talking about my snare drum earlier, um, it's only a bad sound if it's not the one that you're wanting, right? If you, if you intended to do another sound. But it's definitely behooves us to understand that when we play our hi-hat um, like this, there, it sounds different than like this. 
And Bob and I have talked about this before. You know, we he and I talked about in our lesson here because he's playing James Brown, and they had a specific way they approached that hi hat. Uh, if you're playing, um, if you're playing Tom Petty, but. <laughs> I mean, he digs into those hats, and it gives the song a really driving feel. And, and to me, it's, it's very, uh, very much a driving type of a feel. So um, I think that if you're noticing it makes a different sound, I think you're doing the correct thing now. Um, is you're you're listening, and you're hearing that that sound. Um, yeah, you mean that your your stick kind of glitches to the edge? Why I do not want this sound? Yeah, and that's I mean. That's all about it. When I'm playing these, because the, the gig I'm on right now, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the complexity of the notes that I'm playing, if we should say. It's, it's not fast 30 second notes. So I spend a, a whole lot of time thinking about exactly where I'm hitting the cymbal. Um, is, that the, is that the sound I want for that? How am I hitting the hi-hat? I've got some songs where it's slow 6-8. And you barely hear that hi-hat. Um, the one where I play a half a, a, a shuffle. Um. You're hearing more of the eighth note than you are anything else. Um, so yeah, I think the I think the main thing is that you're hearing that that's a different sound and you're already approaching it to make it sound differently how you want it to. I I don't think it's a bad sound. I think it's just not the sound that you want right then. And so if we will avoid labeling things as good or bad. We can use them later, but if we label something as a bad sound, then we don't want to use it because we think it's bad, but it's not. They just have all kinds of different, you know, one of my favorite sounds a cymbal make is this one. I think that's a really cool sound. It's, it's more of a crotali type of a sound. Uh, it can sound great on the end of a ballad, you know. I used it a couple times in our set. It's just kind of, you know, uh, as a little bit, and it looks cool when you're back there. People think like, oh, did you see what he did? It's like, yeah. I know things, you know, you don't know anything. Anyway, first time I saw a player do that, I was like, I got to take from that person. They know things. Um, we got another submitted question. If yeah. you got a question, you can raise your hand. I don't want to ignore anybody. Uh, what's the other submitted one, man? This is our last submitted question. It's from Connie. He says, I've been getting a lot of Buddy Rich on YouTube shorts lately. A lot of what he plays is very snare heavy. I find it quite interesting that drummers today don't do this as much. Why do you think that is? Is it just normal evolution of drums or have players got better at playing the kit versus the snare only? Um, there's no think to it. I know why it is. So the drum set is a new instrument, relatively an instrument speaking, meaning, you know, um, violin. It's been around for a long time. There's a whole school, Suzuki school of violin. Like they have whole methodologies for how you're supposed to approach the violin proper way. The drum set started coming together in the 1920s and um, they came from a rudimental drumming background and so that is how drums were used. They were used uh, in the army. You have uh, three camps. You have different variations of the three camps. They used to use them to muster the soldiers. They would use them to uh, tell them it was time to go to sleep, tell them it was time to eat, tell them it was time to break camp. Uh, there were all kinds of, tell them it's time to wake up. There were all kinds of different calls for that. So they came from a very rudimental background. That is how drums were used in that sense. So you have these drummers coming over that have been playing in orchestras and um, in a rudimental sense with no, they didn't use the kick drum, you know. Um, in New Orleans, you had guys, you had a, a rhythm section uh, that had a bass drum with a hoop that he played an upside down, you know, smaller cymbal, and you had a snare drummer. So the drum set was really only put together uh, on the, um, I'm going to give you way more information you want, Connie, sorry. On the, the riverboats uh, down in New Orleans was when they started putting the, that together. Um, and you got players like Baby Dodds um, who started playing with a bass drum. And if you uh, go to the history of New Orleans drumming, uh, I get into some of that. And so he brought in a bass drum. But the bass drum was a very simple tool at that time. A lot of times they used it to walk quarter notes. Uh, it was a very open sound, a big sound, and the acoustic bass that would play in a lot of, if they were playing um, in a more traditional jazz setting, which also originated in New Orleans, you had a stand-up bass player, and he had a lot of tone, but not a lot of cut. 
And so the, the bass drum was used oftentimes uh, to help the uh, acoustic bass, the stand-up bass, have some cut through the music. It gave a point to that note. Uh, but, you know, very early drumming... Solo might sound like this, you know. Or they would have some wood blocks and they'd be like, I had to play a, a trad, what they call a trad, T R A D, traditional jazz solo, in my uh, for my senior recital. And I had these wood blocks and you know cowbells. You know, it sounds like, what is that guy doing? If you look at early bass drums, they had a lot of accoutrements for triangles and wood blocks, things like that. So we started bringing in orchestral stuff. Why does that matter? Because all they used before then were hands. Also, we didn't have bass drum pedals that were very advanced. So they couldn't do fast doubles. We had bass drums that were big. Uh, when they used to make drum heads... It, they were made on a calf skin. If you had a drummer on tour, they literally would go out and be stretching calf skin over. They'd have to put the hoop on, and then they'd have to cut around the calf skin. People are like, oh, man, we got to go back to calf, can, calf skin heads. You don't want to do that. They're very unpredictable. Every cow's different, you know, and you never know if it's going to be hot or cold or if it's cold, they're brittle and hot. It's like it's a pain. They got hair on them. Um, and so as we developed uh, the technology... Um, when it comes to bass drum pedals, used, used to it was just a pedal and a thing. You bolted a, a strap of leather and it went around, you know, a half crescent. Like that was your bass drum pedal. I've got the original patent, I think, here from William F. Ludwig. So all that to say, we didn't have the hi-hat. Baby Dodds hated the hi-hat. They called it a sock symbol back then because it was down by your foot. It was by, the, it was by your sock. Um, so that's why you had players like Buddy Rich coming up during that time and they were taught a very hands-heavy method. Um, the uh, more linear method that's very popular these days where the bass drum is incorporated a lot into what's going on, um, it's, 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 a more, it's a more modern approach to it. Um, and so you'll see older jazz drummers using a lot of their hands um, and using the bass drum to accentuate what's going on, but there's a lot of hand work in there, a lot. I, I just saw an old... Uh, um, solo that uh, Tony Williams did actually for a new I should tell everyone we should tell everyone here Grant uh, we launched a new YouTube channel uh, this past week it is for the podcast it, uh, you can look up the drum show podcast uh, you can also go to my main YouTube channel and look at the community tab and I've linked to a couple of videos there it is uh, it is the podcast but video format and we're going to have I think 30 episodes up there within the first six weeks and then it will sync up with the podcast, um, with what's going on in the podcast. It is for long form listeners. This is not like for your short five minute YouTube video. Like these are hour, hour and a half interviews, lessons, deep dives. Uh, we've used a couple student calls on there. Um, so it's, it's not for like, oh, I want a five minute, you know, quick. It's like, let's go deep. That's the type of viewer we want there. So if you want to check that out, you can. We really haven't let a lot of people know about that. Um, so you can check. You can be the first. I was going to send an email out today, but then I was like, maybe not. So should, maybe I won't you send should. An email. No, I you should. All see. right. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll send an email out about it. We've actually put a lot of work into it. And then we're like, let's just put it out there. See what everybody says. Um, there's a big thing to be said for letting YouTube find the viewer that watches that kind of content. Um, yeah, Cause we don't want people jumping on the video and then jumping off. We really, we really do want the long form listener. We want them there for a long time on that channel. So um, anyway, yes, so that is my answer, but I was just watching a solo from Tony Williams and it was a ton of hand stuff, you know, and I don't, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's fantastic. It's equally impressive. And then throw the hand, throw the foot in there, you know, occasionally. So, um, yeah, when I'm on a gig, the bass drum doesn't play near as much of a part of things as the hands do. The hands are going the whole time, you know? So um, I, I do believe a lot of those old solos, you will, you will see a lot of hand stuff because they were coming from a hand tradition of only having a, a, that drum. And, you know, 
again, the technology has a lot to do with it. Technology has a ton to do with it. They just didn't have the, the technology we have to do the engineering. Some of it is the actual mechanism. They didn't understand how to make something that precise. The other is the tooling, the machining on that side. We didn't have things dialed in enough to be able to machine things in an assembly line fashion to make a pedal that is that responsive. You know, so a lot of it has to do with, tech, you know, um, uh, advancements in technology when it comes to the tooling, as well as to the mechanics of how we move as a drummer. So, but the drum set is a new instrument, very, very new instrument in terms of instruments worldwide. But it's all um, about being an ensemble. The whole thing is about being an ensemble. It goes back to an African yes. group yes. playing each one person playing what we do all at once. Yes. Yes. And that's why um, a lot of people will, they think, oh, you know, mambo is hard to play, you know, and what they don't realize is it's not hard to play. You're just taking four or five different drummers in the rhythm section, and now you're playing all their parts. Um, and a jazz drummer typically thinks of the drum set as one voice. They don't think of it as snare, tom, you know, they think of it, for instance, when I sound check every day, when I sound check on the we go to the kick drum, snare drum, tom one, tom two, tom three, give me some hi-hat, give me the gong drum, that's good. It's all a separate thing. When you sound check a jazz drummer, they'll say, would you play for me, please? And they start playing and they get an overall sound. As a matter of fact, they might only mic it from the top. They may only have some overhead mics or some room mics because they want to accept the instrument as a whole. They don't want to uh, have it be tom one, tom two, tom three. Uh, um, jazz purists don't think of the drum set in that way. They think of it as one instrument. That would be like a piano player thinking of it as C, C sharp, D, like they're all different notes. Sure, they're different notes, but it's part of an orchestra here that you play. They're not separate from each other. You know, we don't sound check each note on the, on the piano. We don't mic each note, each string on the piano. You know, you want to hear it, how it sounds as an instrument. And sometimes we think differently about that, especially in modern recording with pop and rock. And, you know, the music calls for it, so I get it. But anyway, that was, I'm giving way longer answers than any of you wanted. This is why we had to have a long form channel, because forever in my career, I can't edit myself. Um, oh, you want to know about the bass drum? Boy, do I have a couple hours for you. Um, <laughs> let's go down that rabbit hole. What? Sock symbol? You know the history? <laughs> Grab a chair and a beer. Um, anyway. Sorry, when's the next call? We totally derailed. Is that all the submitted questions? Yes, that's all the submitted questions. Okay. Um, awesome. Next week we got, do we got two calls next week? Yes, we have a nice. practical applications call on Monday at 3 p.m. and then a Q&A on Wednesday at 12. Awesome. Uh, we also do, uh, we opened up two more spots for the November uh, retreat, if anybody's interested. Um, we're really not like, we'll go with the amount we have. Are um, the original we're, we're, eight coming? Uh, yes, yes. As far as I know, the original eight are coming. We added someone this week because we had a cancellation. Um, and, um, and then we are going to try, starting with actually the retreat that Juan's coming to, we're going to try uh, 11 to 12 people. 10 people was just a generic number we set as to like, let's see how it works. And we think we can actually hold 12 and still have it be a really cool uh, experience. We don't want to take away from the community or the camaraderie or the amount of time everybody gets. So we're going to keep an eye on that and make sure. Uh, and if it doesn't work, we'll go back to 10. We're happy to do that. But if we can accept more, we have waiting lists. So if we can accept more, I would like to, to do that. The community is really a bigger part of it than we thought it would be. And so that's been a really cool thing to, to see if we can enhance that um, with a couple more people. That'd be good. If it detracts from that, we'll, we'll go back down to 10. So anyway, um yeah so what time's the call on monday did you say 3 p.m 3 p.m i'll see everybody there and if you're in minneapolis minnesota or around that area i'll be there on saturday so hit me with an email and then i'm going to be a lot of other places in the next four weeks so you may want to check the the website on my tour schedule and um if you're around that area come meet me i'd like to have food or coffee <laughs> probably lots of coffee we'll see everybody next week